All right, John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So for those of you who have not met John yet, Sir John Hargrave is the CEO of Media Shower, one of the leading content marketing firms on the planet. John believes that useful, entertaining, mind-blowing content is the only way to build long-lasting web traffic, search rankings, and sales. There are no shortcuts to success. His new book, Mind Hacking, comes out in January 2016. So John, welcome. It's great to have you. Hey, thank you, Tom. Yeah, so tell us you know, about your background, how you got started as an author and as a content marketer. Yeah, let me tell you about the author journey. It's kind of interesting. So uh, I created one of the very first humor websites uh, back in 1995. It's called Zug.com. And I just always wanted to write. I loved to write. Uh, I'm not a writer by training, but uh, on the fledgling internet, I saw this opportunity to just write and get it out there to an audience. Very small at that time. And uh, so I created this humor website and uh, just kept plugging away at it day after day after day, wrote a lot <laughs> of stuff. And uh, for a long time, I challenged myself to write every day uh, for that website. And we had other contributors as well. So I was also serving um, as editor as well. And that was such a valuable experience. The most, the best advice I can give aspiring writers is just do it. <laughs> just sit down and do it. And especially if you can get it out in front of people, which is very easy, you get immediate feedback and you start to see kind of what works and what doesn't. So years and years and years, uh, I toiled at this. And I think it was, uh, I don't know, it was probably about six years later that uh, I got this email out of the blue. And it was uh, from this gentleman with a, a small publishing house. And he said, uh, I'm interested in uh, having you write a book. And like to me, this was like d a divine message from the gods to receive the offer to write a book. And I thought it was a joke at first. Like, you don't just get an email with somebody asking you to write a book. You've got to go submit it to 5,000 publishers. But this editor had found a really clever way of uh, finding websites that had a following and then turning those into books. Um, and it was a formula that worked really well. So I wrote my first book called Prank the Monkey, which was a collection of humor from Zug.com as well as a lot of additional material. Um, and it was a terrific experience. It was, it taught me <laughs> that a book, <laughs> writing for a book is different from the web. Uh, but it also taught me all the mechanics of uh, publishing and uh, book promotion, which is a huge piece of it. Um, and then I followed that up with a book of humor for kids called Mischief Maker's Manual. And then uh, just recently, as you said, published my new book called Mind Hacking. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's quite a story. So when, when, when was it that you started that, that first website, started writing that first website? Uh, that was 1995. Wow, so I that think was it, really. Yeah, so I think it was about six years um, of just working the craft. And of course, there were lots of you know positive feedback and encouragement and opportunities along the way. But uh, but I would say that was the first big break. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's great. So tell us about this new book, Mind Hacking. Why did you write it? Oh, it's so exciting. Um, so. Basically, mind hacking is, we use hacking in the original programmer sense of the word, um, like a, a clever shortcut or technique that programmers use to solve some problem. And mind hacking is like a shortcut or technique for reprogramming your brain, reprogramming your brain. So if you have problems like procrastinating or you're trying to write your book and you can't get started or you're trying to achieve goals and you can't do it, Mind hacking is a way of figuring out the problems that are stopping you from getting there. And then just like a programmer would do to a computer, you actually reprogram your, your mind to move you in the direction that you want to go. Does that make sense, Tom? Yeah, that's awesome. So this is cool. So first of all, I want to talk about, yeah, like, you know, how did you do the research for this book? You know, is it all based on neuroscience? Like, like let's talk about that first. 
And then I want to get into some some actual like techniques and exercises we can work with people. Yeah, so the story of how I got into it, uh, I won't give away the surprise because it's uh, in the first chapter of the book, but uh, I hit bottom in my life when the Secret Service showed up on my doorstep. And, uh, you know, when the Secret Service comes to your house, it's probably a good indicator that uh, something's gone wrong in your life. And uh, after some soul searching, I realized I had a dependency on drugs and alcohol, and that was what was really leading to these catastrophic problems uh, in my life, like the Secret Service. I made this decision I was going to throw away everything, all my alcohol and drugs that night. And to do that was the most difficult thing I've ever done, hands down. And as I'm standing behind the supermarket, throwing all these bottles of beer and wine into a dumpster, I'm finding that my mind is trying to talk me out of it, saying, "What are you, are you crazy? Think of all the good times we've had with this, with all this alcohol. And I had to literally put my mind on hold. It was like I had to focus on the muscle movement of my legs and arms throwing it in. So it was literally one step at a time, just focusing on the muscle movement. And I found if I did that, I could shut up my mind for a minute and I could actually get through this very difficult uh, task. And I did, and I've been sober ever since. It's been a fantastic decision, a fantastic journey. But along the way, I collected all these mind hacks, all of these techniques for how to stay sober, but also how to improve my life, how to build this company, how to write this book, how to do all of these things uh, that I've accomplished. And I'm just a guy, <laughs> and I just want to share these with everybody else because anybody can learn these techniques to make themselves happier and more productive and more successful. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Great. So let's let's get into it. Then. Let's start with some techniques that people can use to do basic stuff. So I know one of the biggest things that I struggle with as an author at times is like, okay, I want to write a book. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to write a book, but when it comes to actually sitting down at the computer and getting it done, you know, I procrastinate. I put it off. I just not not being productive. So how do you, you know, take someone who's got a goal, something they really want to do, but is procrastinating, putting it off? How do you get them to actually take action? How do you what would you do to mind hack that situation? Yeah, well, you need a habit, right? You need like a, you need to turn it into a daily routine, a daily habit. And uh, there's a great book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And he talks about the research that shows uh, in any habit, we have a cue and then we have a reward. Um, so like if uh, he tells a story of this woman, she's a chronic nail biter. And her cue is she starts running her thumb over her fingernails. And when she finds a jagged edge, she starts biting her nails and she bites them until they bleed. It's very gross. And the reward was that feeling of like, oh, my, my nail is clean. And so they figured out a way of making her aware of the cue and then putting in a new reward. And she was cured, lifelong nail biter. She's cured in like two weeks. So when you're trying to create a new habit, you can hack it by creating your own cue and your own reward. So for example, if you're trying to um, write more frequently, you put a cue or like a visual reminder somewhere that you'll see first thing when you get up. You know, So it could be a copy of your manuscript that you're working on, or you put a sticky note like right in the middle of your computer monitor or something like that. And that could have a little goal on it. I heard one of your previous podcast guests say, you know, strive for just two double space pages a day. And so that could be the cue is like a sticky note with two double space pages. That's it. And you do that before you do anything else. But then you lock it in with a reward. So then you go out and make sure you have a consistent reward, something easy like a coffee or a smoothie or a shower or whatever it is. But you got to train yourself like a dog. Like you have to say, I'm only going to give myself the reward on the days that I do it. And I'm going to withhold the reward on the days that I don't. And if you do those two things consistently in a month's time, you're going to be uh, an awesome writer. Hmm. You know, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I love how you just explained that. And I think that's so crucial that the reward part, right? Like I just got a puppy a couple weeks ago. And the first puppy I've ever had, like I had, you know, dogs growing up, but I wasn't in charge of, you know, training them. So now I'm training this puppy and it's so amazing, you know, the similarities between training a puppy and training yourself. Like you just said, you know, building those habits in a puppy is the same thing you can do to build habits in your own life. So that's, 
uh, really crucial. And I think that reward piece is the, really the big piece. Like, you know, if you say, I'm not going to shower today unless I write my two double space pages. Like, <laughs> you know, like, That's a great like, idea. You're write those pages within a week, I guarantee it. Right? Like, you're not going to go much longer without showering because you're going to get all that social feedback on, on how bad you're smelling and stuff. Right? So, um, that's that's big, but I think um, you know a lot of people might be afraid of that. Like, well, I'm not sure if I can really hold myself to that standard. Um, have you used uh, rewards like that for yourself, and how has that worked? Oh yeah, I use them every <laughs> every day. I mean, this is really part of my own uh, daily habit routine. So I have rewards like when I exercise, uh, or you know, when I I have a meditation time in the morning when I do that. Yeah, but I love the shower idea because I think that's a that's a great reward. I get clean if I do it, and I smell if I don't. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. It's funny because you know I think these strategies and, and like mind hacks, like you're talking about, you know, like we never learned this stuff in school, you know. Right. But imagine if you had how much more successful you'd be, not just in school and academics, but in every area of life by understanding how to actually get yourself to do what you want to do, because that's the, that's the tough thing. I mean, anyone can say, hey, I want to write a book. When it comes down to actually sitting down day after day after day and writing those pages, you know, few people ever get past that hump. Yeah, I totally agree, Tom. I think there's so many missing skills that kids don't get in school. And, you know, a lot of my uh, purpose in writing this book was to teach some of those missing skills. It's all the things around you know, motivation and, you know, goal setting and goal achievement and just figuring out how to manage your mind because, you know, everything in our lives starts in our minds, right? Like we have a thought and then we act on that thought. So uh, if we can learn to manage those thoughts and to be the master of those thoughts, to be in control of those thoughts to some degree, then we all of a sudden have this newfound mastery over our lives. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I know in your book, you talk about how awareness is one of the first steps to really making change. Can you talk yeah. about that and why it's so important, how to cultivate that? Yeah, well, as I was just saying, you know, you got to you got to get on top of your thoughts. And um, a hack that I think a lot of people have uh, have enjoyed is is called just getting into the balcony. So it's almost like you're like getting into the balcony and looking down on your mind, if you can imagine that. And it's almost like if I, if I just ask you right now to, to picture your mind, whoever's listening, just picture your mind, you'll see right away that there's this thing called a mind and there's this thing called you. You're not your mind. You're, you're separate from your mind. And if you can develop the habit of getting into the balcony, looking down on the mind, um, in the book we call it super user mode, like getting into a computer's like admin account, it's the same kind of idea. Then you can start to really hack it. You can start to figure out what's going on in my mind. <laughs> what are these thoughts that are kind of habitually uh, going through my mind, good and bad? And then you can start to root out those problem thoughts because we're usually not really aware of them. If there's a thought that says, I'm never going to finish this book, and that's the thought that's kind of there just beneath the surface, then you're never going to finish this book. You're just not going to do it. But you might not even be aware that that's the thought. Once you get into the balcony, start looking down, then you can start to see that and reprogram it. Mm, absolutely. You know, that's such a great point. I, I mean, I don't know if you call it like the subconscious where you have these thoughts like, you know, I can't write this book, I can't complete this task. Um, but, I, you know, in my own experience, in my own life, I know that there's always been times where if I was stuck at something, like if something wasn't working out for weeks and months at a time, there was something going on up here that I wasn't really aware of. And when I finally found that awareness, then I was able to actually make a shift and make a change. But yeah. you know, if you see people you know, banging your head against the wall over and over and over again, in my experience, that's almost always been the case that it's just something unconscious that I'm not paying attention to is going on. It's kind of controlling me, right? Yeah, yeah. Or the thought that I'll never get published. It's too hard to get published. You gotta find an agent. I'll never get an agent. All of that. Well, why not? Why not? People publish books every day. People get agents every day. There's all kinds of ways to publish nowadays. Why can't you? Like, there's really no excuse. Maybe you got to work at it. <laughs> Maybe you're going to, like me, have a period of training that you're going to have to go through. But if you love writing, you won't mind doing that. It will just flow effortlessly and eventually you'll get there.
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what are some of the mind hacks that you use, you know, besides picturing the mind, like we just mentioned, to actually get awareness on things? So, you know, let's say like in your own life, you know, you're struggling with, uh, you know, something and you just can't seem to get it done. You can't seem to get the result that you want. How would you go about solving this problem? Well, uh, there's, um, there's, there's one, uh, there's kind of a pair of hacks, <clears throat> the bookend technique that may help your listeners. And, and uh, in the morning, uh, as soon as you get up or as soon as you get to your computer, the first thing you do is you ask yourself, uh, what are the three most important things I have to get done today? We call it the three mit, three most important things. Um, this is assuming you don't have the sticky note on your monitor telling you what to do. So the three most important things. And usually if you think about it, it's pretty easy to figure out what the three really important things are, like the things that are really going to move things forward for you. And you write those down. And the idea is you do the first one of those things first before you do anything else. Now, what most of us do is we do the easy work first or we kind of ease into the day by surfing the web or something like that, right? <laughs> Or we do something like answering email, which keeps us busy, but it never really moves things forward. So you do that difficult thing first, and then you allow yourself you know, the email or the web surfing as a reward before you move on to the second most important thing. That first, that first thing might be doing the two double space pages, and then you allow yourself the reward. So that's the first thing. The second hack is at the end of the day, you do the, the day in review. So basically, just before you go to bed, you just look at the day and you ask yourself, what did I do today that really moved the needle, that really moved the ball forward, that actually made a difference today? And when I started doing this, I was really amazed that most days the answer was nothing. I did nothing today that actually moved things forward, even though I was super busy I didn't, I wasn't doing the high value work that I really need to be focusing on. I was just staying busy. So uh, doing those two things, the three mit in the morning and the day in review at night can be super useful for accomplishing goals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's awesome. That's some awesome strategies there. And it's actually very similar to what I've been doing for a couple of years. And what's that? Yeah, like, huh? What, what is that? I'm curious. Okay, so yeah, so in the morning, well actually, so what I do is the night before, so right before I go to bed, I, I always write down my tasks for the day coming mm -hmm. up, and then I prioritize and I pick up, okay, what is the one thing that's most important that I really need to get done? Because mm -hmm. right? what I found is if I can just do the most important thing every day, then like there's nothing more you could ask for. Like if you do the most important work, you know, that's it. That That's the most important thing. And each day, obviously, it's going to change and evolve, but, um, you know, putting things off like, that's really important, like writing that book or getting it published. Yeah. Um, you know, then you just feel like you're stagnant. Like, like, you know, like you said, you know, at the end of the day, you look back in your day, like, well, I didn't really work on my book. That's what I really want to do, but I didn't do it. Um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, having that reflective period at the end of the day for me has been crucial too, because then it becomes really obvious. Like it's easy to go like a week or a month or a year when you're not reviewing your days, you're not looking back on your life and just not write the book because you're not thinking about it. You know, right. it's like you just get in this habit of sort of walking through your days and not getting stuff done. So I think, you know, forcing yourself to look back on your day at the end of the day is just an incredible hack to just make sure that you're constantly aware of whether you're moving forward or not. And just having that awareness will drive you to take the action that will make you more successful. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really love that. And, uh, I, I tell the story in the book about, uh, this fellow, Dr. Richard Peabody, and he was one of the first ones to come up with a treatment for chronic alcoholics. Treated hundreds of alcoholics. He was the first one to kind of come up with a cure. And part of the cure was exactly what you do. He had the alcoholic at the uh, end of the day write down a list of everything they would do the next day and a complete to-do list, every block of time, including rest. <laughs> like if you're gonna take a nap, you would write that down. And then at the end of the day, you would like cross every one of those things off or as many as you got done. And then you do it again for the next day. And so, you know, when you are an addict or an alcoholic, there's this negative spiral. It's like you, you know, you, <laughs> you get drunk, you <laughs> black out, you wake up the next morning feeling horrible. And so to feel better, you drink again and it just gets worse and worse. 
this turned it into a positive spiral where now at the end of the day you see like okay i actually got some like positive momentum in my life what can i do tomorrow and so the 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 uh, flywheel starts spinning in the opposite direction so that's what you're actually doing which is a great a great hack Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, like awareness is everything, you know, because if you're not aware of a problem, it's, you're not going to solve it, you know, but as soon as you become aware of it and if you can, you know, maintain that awareness long enough, cause it's uncomfortable. Like it's really uncomfortable to look at your life and be like, okay, I'm obviously failing when it comes to writing my book or whatever it is. That's really uncomfortable to be present with those feelings, you know, of, of not being successful and of not doing what you really want to do with your life. But if you can be present with it long enough, You'll, eventually you'll get that urge to, okay, I'm going to do this, you know, and you get that willpower or inspiration or whatever you want to call it and to just get it done. But for me, without that awareness, it's not even possible. Yeah. Yeah. Building awareness is huge. And uh, one of the hacks uh, that we talk about is, is concentration training. And this is how you really build this awareness um, on a daily basis. You might know it as meditation or mindfulness, but you basically carve out 15 or 20 minutes in the morning and you just sit quietly and you try to concentrate on your breath. That's it. Like you try to keep your concentration focused in one point at your breath. And we kind of turn it into a game, like a video game. So when you notice your attention wandering, um, like thinking about what you got to do today or some conversation in the past, you just redirect your mind back to the breath and you give yourself a point. We call them awareness points. And so this technique, um, we've gotten feedback that it's actually people who've tried meditation like this a lot better because with meditation, when your mind wanders, you feel kind of bad and you try to stay focused. But with this, you you when you realize that your, your mind is drifting, you feel kind of good because you get a point for that. So you get this little dopamine hit and then you focus it back on the breath. And developing this concentration not only helps you stay more focused on tasks like writing, but it also just makes you so much clearer. And there's tons of research that shows it makes you healthier, it improves your relationships, and so on. So uh, I do it every morning. Highly recommended. Absolutely. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, same here. I, I've always been really uncomfortable with the term meditation. So yeah. I think there's a lot of like religious stuff around yeah. it. Yeah. And a lot of baggage. Yeah, baggage and traditions and certain, you know, like for me, you know, doing like the lotus position is the most uncomfortable position I could possibly put my body in. Yeah. And so to sit that way for 20, 30 minutes for me is like torture. You yeah. know, so when I Maybe finally, I like, I don't even know, like I just had a friend who was like, you know, you could just meditate walking or sitting or like any position you want. You don't have to be in that. And I was like, oh, there's like, for me, that was like a huge light bulb moment where it finally opened up meditation being possible for me because before that, it's like there's no way I'm gonna sit in that position, you know, for even five minutes and, and be comfortable. So, um, so I, I like that you've kind of changed the term terminology around that because I don't think it has to be religious and I don't think it has to be, you know, the set formula that everyone has to do it the exact same way. As long as you're aware of what's going on in your mind and, and you know holding that awareness of your breath and so forth, um, it can, can have very positive impacts. And that's what the, the research has shown as well. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, though, Tom, because. Um... It was really my goal to make a book that was like really fun to read and didn't have all that baggage, but also very practical, something that anybody can do regardless of what your background or belief system is. And I think there, you know, people put a lot of uh, a lot of weight into things like the lotus position and things like that. I don't think it matters. I think that what matters is that you spend the time actually developing these powers of awareness or these powers of concentration. So yeah, you can absolutely, I mean, I just sit in a comfortable chair. I don't have any pretzel yoga poses. <laughs> um, and you can do it walking, as you said. You can do it while you're driving the car. You can uh, do it while you're doing the dishes. I have a friend who's gotten really into this and he just does it while taking a quick walk through the woods near his house. So it's available to you anytime. But I do find it's best if you set aside a specific time to do it every day again just like writing make it a habit mm, absolutely totally agreed yeah I, I like what you just mentioned about driving i've actually noticed that too so i used to be like you know kind of a frustrated driver you know stuck in traffic that kind of stuff would just like really yeah. bother me 
And after you know meditating for a couple of years, now it's like I get in the car and like I like it's almost like a great feeling of like okay now it's time I can focus on my body and my posture and my breathing and and like meditate while I'm driving and and obviously you know still paying attention to the road and, and you know being a very safe driver, but it's turned like what used to be like a stressful event into something that's like I look forward to and enjoy and it can be totally calm and refreshed at the end of a drive. I love that. Let me tell you a similar story. So there's this podcast uh, called Simple Programmer. It's run by this guy named uh, John Sanmez. Great podcast. And he uh, told the story about um, that he used to also just get really frustrated in traffic. Whenever you get stuck in a traffic jam, just get really upset and angry. And then one day he developed that awareness. Somehow it just came on him that like, this is crazy. I, I can't control the traffic. Why am I getting upset about this? And he came up with this mind hack to basically reprogram his brain and say, whenever I get stuck in traffic in the future, I'm going to just see it as a positive thing. Like I can work on a difficult problem in my head or I can make a phone call or I can listen to a podcast. And so he turned it from this really stressful daily event into, like you said, a productive and positive event. And that that sums up mind hacking in a neat little package right there. You know, if you can just find the tools to do each of those things, the awareness, the kind of debugging of the mind, and then the positive reprogramming, that's how to make your life infinitely better. Absolutely, man. Totally agree. And, you know, one of my big lessons from that too is that it's not just about having the awareness and the tools, it's also having them at the right time. Yeah. Right? Because you can be like totally zen, calm, focused you know, lotus position on the floor at 6 a.m. in the morning. But then if you don't, if you can't bring that into driving your car or writing your book or the rest of your life, you know, you're missing out. And so for me, you know, realizing, okay, how can I take these meditation, concentration, focus skills and, and, and not just at 6 a.m., but at, you know, in every different area and activity of my life. Uh, and for me, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, it's, it's like a video game. It's like constantly, hacking my life. How can I improve at ultimate? Yeah. How can I improve in my relationship with my wife and you know every area of my life? And I think that is kind of the next level of mind hacking is not just, you know, mind hacking so you can write a book, but then every area of life, right? How can you improve every area of your life? Totally. I mean, these tools are applicable to any problem that you have, any problem, thought or negative thinking. And I also want to say, you know, it's it's you're totally right about bringing it out into your life. And many people have this idea that you're going to walk around like the Dalai Lama or, you know, like a yogi, just like blessing everything. And it's really not like that. Um, I, You know, I will get crazy at times when the situation calls for it. But I also don't have this nervous energy like I used to have, you know, like where like <laughs> my foot would constantly be twitching and uh, and I would be doing a lot of kind of unproductive, inefficient effort because there were all these anxious and compulsive loops running through my head. I've learned to take control of those, reprogram them so that I can bring that uh, sense of awareness to my life. Hmm, definitely. That's awesome. Well, I know this book is going to be something that's going to make a big difference in a lot of people's lives. So I just want to honestly just thank you for writing it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to dial, delving into it and reading the whole thing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So before you go, I know you've got some awesome, awesome book promotion stuff that you're doing, some really unique stuff. And I wonder if you could share that real quick. Yeah. So as I said, a big part of doing books is you have to promote the book. And uh, it's it's easy to promote a book in that there are so many different channels and it's difficult in that there's so many channels. <laughs> You've got so many things. So I wanted to do something that would, uh, that, that people would notice and at the same time be a, a real personal challenge. So I have uh, decided to go without food for 21 days. The book is called Mind Hacking, How to Change Your Mind for Good in 21 Days. And in keeping with that theme, I'm going with no food for 21 days. And uh, the goal here is to really show how through hacking your mind, through creating positive mental loops, we can achieve superhuman efforts. Again, I'm just a guy. This is something that anybody can do. And yet I'm showing 
Um, I hope <laughs> that through mind hacking, anybody can do amazing things and push themselves to the limit that they, they never thought possible. And I'm on day eight right now, day eight. That's awesome. So you're on day eight of your 21 days with yeah. no food. So is this like a water fast, a juice fast? Like, tell us, you know, what's your methodology right now? Water, home slice, all water. Yeah, that's amazing. So have you ever done fast like this before? Uh, occasionally I've done shorter ones, but uh, definitely nothing of 21 days. But it's been amazing. I mean, I I it's I know this seems hard to believe, but I actually feel more uh, energetic right now than I have the whole time so far, and even sometimes when I'm eating. <laughs> and uh, but so much of it is a mental game. I can't tell you. It's like you just constantly have to tell yourself, "I'm going to do this." Like you cannot have any doubt in your mind. You must er eradicate doubt and just say, "I am going to do this. It is going to be a good thing." I am going to feel good and just constantly repeat that to yourself. It really works. Absolutely. That's awesome. And I know there's a lot of research that's actually shown, you know, going on fast like that can actually help trigger a uh, process in the body that can help fight cancer and, and cleanse your body of cancer cells and other things as well. Yeah. It's a great book. I just blogged about it by uh, Joel Furman called uh, fasting and eating for health and uh, reading those kinds of books. Um, you know, uh, it, it are really helpful also because then you, you're getting encouragement. So you're finding like, okay, you know, I, this actually, you know, there's a lot of pseudoscience around fasting, but there's actually a lot of real science as well that shows that like in laboratory mice, it helps extend their lives and so forth. And uh, so focusing on that and saying, yeah, this actually is kind of good for me, kind of cleaning it out. That's another way of turning this potentially negative experience uh, into a positive. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So how are you using that to actually promote the book? Yeah, so I've, uh, I'm, I'm putting up a series, a 21 day series uh, of posts on the web. It's on Medium, it's on all my social media accounts. Um, talking through the experience, all the mind hacks I'm using, those are getting picked up uh, worldwide, and then I'm posting pictures, so you'll see before and after pictures as I go along, and uh, I think I've lost uh, 16 pounds as of this morning, so it's going to be a pretty striking difference, you'll you'll see, but it's, it's uh, the response has been amazing, people have been saying they're really inspired, or mm -hmm. horrified, one of the two. <laughs> That's good, well, if you don't have both sides, then maybe you're not doing something unique enough, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, John. You shared just some awesome information with us today. I really appreciate it. Before you go, tell us where people find out more about you and your new book, Mind Hacking. Yeah, well, you can go uh, order uh, Mind Hacking at Amazon.com. It's available everywhere. Uh, I'm also available on LinkedIn if you want to connect with me there. And as I said, I've got a blog on Medium.com as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Have a great day. Thanks, Tom.